yeah, let me let's let's uh, let's get you know started. So since we're, we're sort of uh, try to be on time, yeah, today we're, we're quite happy to have uh, Young Jun Kim from uh, University of Toronto to give a talk on the afternoon three tri Actually, I, I believe Young Jun, if I'm correct, I mean, you, you're the first original person, right? Who you know did this first, right? And instead of the Oak Ridge Group, right? You guys did the, the original measurement on the uh, afternoon three tri right? And then Oak Ridge did a bunch of measurement, you know, claiming it's a cathode, right? Maybe you can sort of. Uh, you know, spell the history sort of more, more sort of clearly on this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all, yeah, all, yeah, smile, okay. all smiles. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Steve gave a talk on this, you know, some, yeah, some time yeah. ago. I'm sure, you know, I continue. I mean, it doesn't really matter, right? Long term wise, but if you try to get the bottom of this. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, we're very happy to have uh, Young Jun give a, you know, talk with the title of revisiting, you know, crystal and magnetic structures of afternoon trichloride. Yeah. So uh, okay, yeah, it's it's, it's all yours, uh, Yangjun. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Peng Cheng, for um, for the introduction, kind, and then also um, uh, giving me this opportunity to to give a talk about our, our sort of a recent uh, uh, series of work on on alpha ruthenium trichloride, um, and uh, yeah, so it's it's uh, something that uh, has drawn a lot of attention over the last uh, decade or so. Um, but uh, there are still a lot of questions remaining. I think more more questions than answers. So I think I kind of want to uh, use this uh, sort of a thing to sort of tell you about more more our recent work, trying to focus on the more basics of of alpha ruthenium trichloride um, uh, to to sort of uh, set the stage for the sort of next. Uh, sort of better understanding of this material. So there is no big reveal of any sort of big thing. So I think that if you are looking for that, I think you, you may be disappointed. Uh, so it's a sort of a very kind of detailed study of uh, how alpha ruthenium chloride uh, behaves in it as you cool down uh, in, in temperatures. Um, yeah, so uh, we've been uh, working on this for a long time as uh, uh, Peng Cheng mentioned. So uh, we actually st started working on this in uh, 2010 or something like that. Um, well, uh, before all these things became uh, uh, very, very popular. So we first, uh, I think, put out our uh, sort of uh, magnetism and more ideas about the the, the, the electronic structure and, and stuff like that. And, and and first and then and then we sort of uh, uh, just showed that it's a zigzag order uh, as found in in this material, just like in the iridates. I guess all this uh, uh, the interest in this thing actually uh, for me originated from study of iridates, where a lot of uh, interesting uh, things were happening. And then so that sort of kind of uh, kick started this this research. And then I think the other other people followed. Um, so because of that, I think we have been uh, fortunate to ha be able to collaborate with many, many people. So you might actually notice that I have uh, uh, the uh, NCNR uh, collaborators. So that our first nutrient scattering was done in NCNR before I think we kind of uh, uh, couldn't do any more of a nutrient scattering because of the shutdown there. Um, and then, but of course, uh, being in, in University of Toronto is uh, tremendously helpful because we we were able to talk to a lot of these uh, excellence theorists who were very helpful in in understanding some of the results that we had. And then also over over time, uh, many generations of a PhD and then postdoc uh, students were are working on this. Uh, and then uh, I, and then we collaborate with many people uh, um, uh, here in, in Canada and other places. I think that I'll, I'll show you a little bit of uh, actually our recent uh, collaboration with the Stephen Julian group on uh, torque magnetometry. Okay, um, so uh, so here's uh, actually uh, in, in lieu of uh, introduction, I sort of uh, want to sort of list to some of the questions that the many people might have on on this material. So. Um, Right. So I think the many people, uh, the first thing probably people uh, comes to people's mind is uh, the quantum thermal hole effect observation. And then actually what the, what's the story about that one uh, recently? And then also there was observation of quantum oscillations in the material. And these are things that uh, a lot of people are interested in. Um, the and, so the the my quick answer to that is actually although those are the big questions, I I really cannot answer those questions uh, because uh, I I'm really not a, a thermal transport or person. And then uh, I'll sort of get to the more focus on the crystal structure and crystal uh, uh, phase transitions and, and stuff like that here. And and sort of the big question that I want to sort of start with is actually what is the crystal structure of alpha ruthenium chloride. 
And it turns out this is a much more complicated uh, uh, story than one would have imagined uh, uh, sort of a, sort of thinking thinking at this uh, from from like the very simple point of view uh, like 13 years ago. So uh, and then that can kind of gives rise to questions about what are the differences between samples which show different behaviors that these thermal transport properties and and then how they are grown and so on. These are things that I'll just go over. And then some of the uh, the our uh, uh, work recently we have done uh, using uh, resonant inelastic X-ray scattering is something that we will uh, will uh, sort of talk about a little bit. Um, so. I, uh, I mean, I'm kind of uh, thinking that the audience that uh, comes to uh, log into at this uh, time to to listen to this talk probably doesn't need any introduction to uh, the material itself. But uh, I always tell my uh, uh, students that uh, you you have to have introduction for any talk that you give. So I want to actually uh, uh, practice what I preach. So I'll give a very brief introduction about the material. So um, we we were uh, sort of at the, the the overall arching idea of uh, ruthenium interest in ruthenium uh, trichloride is because of the quantum spin liquid physics, right? So this is a holy grail that a lot of people working in quantum magnetism is uh, trying to look for. Uh, and then we learned that traditional uh, recipe for making a quantum spin liquid is to start with the same with the quantum spins and then uh, suppress the magnetic order. Uh, uh, with the traditionally with the geometric frustration and and you get some interesting physics uh, such as uh, in the triangular lattice or Kagome lattice and and this is the Herbert Smithite uh, and and also uh, the recently I think or actually for a long time pyrochlor lattice has been the three dimensional version like the the D uh, frustrated lattice that has been drawing a lot of attention I think uh, Peng Cheng obviously worked on this uh, uh, many years. Um, and uh, I think these uh, figures I took from uh, Colin Brolum's uh, review paper, which is an excellent introduction if you're interested in this. And I think that over time, we also learned that spins here do not mean necessarily uh, in electron spins, degrees of freedom. It can be other types of uh, uh, effective or pseudo spins, uh, half degrees of freedom. Kitaev quantum spin liquid is, uh, is different because it, it is a uh, uh, generally described as something on the honeycomb lattice. And we all know the honeycomb lattice is not a, a geometrically frustrated lattice. It is a bipartite lattice. So you can actually have a nail ordering on this um, material. But of course, Kitaev suggested that if you have uh, some uh, uh, bond dependent uh, interaction called the Kitaev interaction, then you can actually have exchange of frustration that gives rise to exactly the solvable model with a quantum spin liquid ground state uh, and also um, uh, so, it, and then it, it sort of requires a special exchange interaction between uh, edge sharing octahedra. And this is where I think the uh, Jacqueline and Kululin comes in and then they propose that actually one way to actually uh, realize this uh, kind of weird looking uh, Kitaev exchange interaction is in a material with a strong spin orbit coupling. And a good example they uh, sort of used is the iridates where we have five D electrons in, in T2G levels with one unoccupied state. And because of the uh, strong spin orbit coupling, you can actually have a uh, half field effective uh, J equals half state, which is essentially Kramer's doublet that we were talking about in terms of pseudo spin. And if they're on, on this uh, edge sharing lattice, uh, 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 octahedra, octahedra are sort of forming a square lattice, uh, forming a, the honeycomb lattice using edge sharing geometry, then you will uh, achieve uh, Kitaev interaction. So, um, so that actually gives rise to a lot of uh, a Kitaev, so-called Kitaev materials. And then that has been a very popular uh, topic of study over in the last decade. Uh, sodium iridium oxide and lithium iridium oxide was the first to uh, sort of came along. And then we learned that there are three dimensional version of lithium iridium oxide. And also there is uh, this, uh, uh, the intercalated uh, version of uh, lithium iridium oxide, which was uh, discovered by uh, Hide Takagi's group. Um, and then there, a lot of studies have been done on the uh, iridates, but the ruthen ruthenium uh, chloride is something that uh, kind of uh, wasn't really drawing a lot of attention because ruthenium is uh, obviously has a, a weaker spin orbit coupling and people didn't think that it might it may not have enough uh, or like large enough spin orbit coupling to realize Kitaev interaction. But I think we actually uh, found that the crystal structure looks a pretty uh, a sort of a very I like idealized crystal structure actually allows us to think about uh, Kitaev physics. 
And uh, so uh, there have been a lot of uh, uh, review papers written on this topic, so I'll, I'll not uh, sort of go into that. But oh, even though I think a lot of people in terms of magnetism community, I think uh, got interested in the ruthenium chloride, um, it was really this paper that put uh, ruthenium chloride on the map, uh, which is Yuji Matsuda's group, uh, Yuji Matsuda group's work on the, uh, the discovery of quantized thermal hole effect in, in this uh, uh, alpha ruthenium trichloride. And uh, so what happens is that uh, if you take, I mean, so alpha ruthenium trichloride orders magnetically around the seven Kelvin, so definitely it is not a quantum spin liquid, but if you actually apply a magnetic field and not a very large magnetic field, a weak magnetic field of about seven Tesla along uh, uh, in, in the honeycomb plane, you can actually suppress this uh, nail ordering uh, uh, all the way. And, and that was known for, for, for a while, but uh, what uh, uh, Yuji Matsuda's group uh, found was that after the order is suppressed, you can actually uh, have uh, some intermediate uh, phase, which uh, they uh, sort of uh, called uh, is, uh, is a, a quantum spin liquid or Kitai of quantum spin liquid. And the evidence for this uh, they uh, uh, sort of provided was that if you measure the thermal hole effect, then within this particular region, region where they claim is the Kitai of spin liquid, they find that the, the, the thermal hole uh, conductivity is quantized and it shows a plateau, which uh, matches exactly half of the quantum that you, you think is, is, is responsible for, for, for thermal uh, conduction. So meaning that the, the, there is a fractional excitation that is responsible for heat conduction in this, this material. So this is an amazing result and this has drawn a lot of attention and this is really uh, considered as a smoking gun uh, evidence for uh, Kitai quantum spin liquid in, in this material. However, uh, since that time, uh, there has been somewhat uh, sort of a, I guess, uh, uh, controversial uh, aspect of this because uh, people were trying to reproduce this result. Uh, first, uh, Fan Ong published their result on, on, on a different sample, and then they didn't see any quantization uh, sort, of, sort of reaching that, that, that the value or half quantized level that the, they saw, the Machuda group saw before. And Louis Talifier group also studied uh, this, and then they didn't see any of this uh, uh, quantization. Um, but uh, uh, Hide Takagi actually uh, looked at the, 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 the sample, which is actually, by the way, grown by the same group. Uh, they actually were able to see this uh, as a quantized levels over here at certain uh, uh, temperature. So, so that's uh, somewhat controversial. And the second controversy about thermal transport actually it was uh, originating from the original paper that Fan Ong's group uh, put out. Uh, so when they actually uh, did this work, they didn't see the quanti quantized thermal hole, but actually the kappa XX, the, the diagonal uh, sort of the thermal conductivity, they found that uh, there is actually this uh, very interesting oscillatory behavior, and they uh, call this uh, a quantum oscillation because of, of the spin on Fermi surface. Um, and that actually claim also uh, uh, met uh, a lot of resistance because uh, the uh, Takagi group's work showed that uh, they, they are not uh, a quantum oscillation and then they are just a, a different types of phase transition. And then the same uh, viewpoint was uh, expressed by uh, a Talifair group. Uh, they showed actually uh, the, these uh, uh, sort of uh, different directions show different uh, uh, field, the, the transitions. And then they actually sort of claimed that this again is uh, as, uh, 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 due to um, multiple phase transitions. So there seems to be uh, somewhat of a stalemate uh, here uh, because of this uh, sort of uh, uh, differing opinions about or different experimental results. I think a lot of uh, this thermal result, thermal conductive, thermal transport results has been sort of a controversial. Um, although those are really big questions, then we have to go back and then trying to think about, so what, what are the differences? So what is actually causing this kind of thing? So let's actually go back to the crystal growth and then uh, examine what, what we know about this, this material. So uh, currently I think there are three types of uh, crystal growth methods that's uh, known uh, to produce this, uh, this crystal. So, um, so what is well known is actually, you can use a vapor transport method to grow uh, crystals. And that has been the original method that a lot of people used, including us in the early days of uh, crystal growth. Uh, and, um, 
so so we call this thin crystal. It produces very uh, sort of a kind of a, a large area, but very thin crystal and has a very clear, actually, uh, the uh, sort of 120 degrees uh, sort of edges and so on. So it looks OK. But it turns out that uh, to get better crystal, you need a, uh, 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 to use a sublimation method. So these, uh, the ruthenium chloride doesn't melt. It actually sublimates uh, at uh, first. So I think, so using just a, uh, the same similar actually type of uh, experimental uh, uh, setup that you can actually grow fairly large crystals. And this was actually done first by Oak Ridge Group. Uh, uh, Dave Mandrus and, and other people actually were able to grow very large crystal using sublimation. And this is actually a really beautiful crystal that's produced it by uh, 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 Jan and, and McGuire in, in this, uh, this paper published here. And then we actually use the same, same sort of type of sublimation method to, to produce this uh, nice crystal. And you can also see that I, actually, I, if you Google um, alpha ruthenium chloride crystal, you can actually buy them. So they sell this and then this, I can sort of have just looking at this, this is grown with a vapor transport and probably not a very good quality crystals. Uh, the third method uh, that is a, a, a so-called vertical Bridgman method. So the details are, are kind of scant on this because uh, uh, there's uh, not much detail provided in this, uh, the crystal growth, but these are all the crystals that's used by uh, Yuji Matsuda's group and, and, and their collaborators uh, to, observe this uh, uh, quantized thermal hole effect. And then this is a sort of example of crystals that they used. Um, and then sort of from the size here, this is a one millimeter bar. So I think that's, uh, uh, it's it's not a big crystal, but uh, I, I clearly a very high quality crystal. So, so right now, I think the people consider this and then also these uh, large, very thick crystals grown using sublimation as high quality crystals. And the way actually you can tell is if you look at the so people usually use is uh, look at the uh, uh, the specific heat data and see actually how many transitions you see in the specific heat and then if you have a very sharp one transition around seven Kelvin that's the signature of a high quality crystal and that has been known for for basically almost uh, ten years and then I think the people are sort of really looking for this and then and and many many of the cases I think experiments were done with this this type of crystals. Um, so, but, so I want to actually make a case is there, so, th so this is bad crystal, people all kind of talk about this. And then, so let's actually kind of ignore this for now. And then uh, I'll come back to this actually, but uh, let's say that the, all the crystals uh, grown by us and then also by uh, a, a sort of uh, at Oak Ridge and also uh, uh, by uh, the, 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 in, the in, in Tanaka group, they all sort of show very clear uh, one, uh, one peak uh, crisp, the transition. However, even in those cases, I think they actually show quite a, a significant uh, sample dependence among so-called high quality samples. So, um, and then, and, and, and on top of that, I think that has something to do with this is actually, there is actually, even though those peaks are very, very sharp, uh, see the heat capacity peak, they kind of ranges between about 6.5 Kelvin to 7.9 Kelvin. And, and I think the general consensus now is that actually the higher TN uh, above seven Kelvin is is a better quality than and then uh, the lower TN the like six point five Kelvin and I'll come back to this and sort of kind of illustrate this and this is actually kind of a consensus emerging in recent years uh, by all three uh, groups and uh, and I think the thermal conductivity actually shows a, a, even in, among these uh, there's a sort of a so called high quality crystals that shows a quite large differences and then. These are four samples studied by Talifair group and then show fairly large difference in the thermal conductivity. And then this is uh, like four samples uh, from the, the publication and then show the field dependence of the thermal conductivity, just uh, a regular thermal conductivity and the field dependence shows uh, a fairly large, I mean, sort of features may be actually coinciding, but actually the, the magnitude seems to be very different. And the claim uh, by uh, uh, the uh, 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 Matsuda group and, and, and co-workers is that unless you have a really, really uh, high thermal conductivity uh, or which is probably suggesting that very small in-plane defect, you're, you're not going to see thermal hole uh, effect. And then that's sort of their claim. And th in this paper, they claim that if you 
have uh, even in uh, all the good samples in their samples i think only the samples with extremely high thermal conductivity shows uh, the 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 quantize the whole if, uh, whole effect so so that may be, be be the case and but we don't know actually what what makes that that that's those samples special compared to other other samples which looks reasonably uh, good quality uh, for 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 our case um, anyway, so that's sort of a kind of a long-winded sort of introduction to uh, the current status of the samples. So let's go back to the question, my original question about what is the what is the crystal structure of alpha ruthenium chloride? And here is actually the answer. Um, sort of, I can uh, say tell you is that uh, the, that everybody agrees these days is that at room temperature, the, it is a monoclinic structure. So if you take honeycomb lattice like this and then stack them along uh, in this uh, crystallographic direction, so this is A is along the zigzag direction and then B is along the armchair direction. So um, if you take this and then uh, stack sort of a kind of uh, shift to this along the zigzag direction or A direction, then that's the the monoclinic uh, uh, structure, and and that's uh, the 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 structure at room temperature. But what's actually uh, interesting or kind of a, a maddening about this uh, sample is that as you cool this below one hundred fifty Kelvin, you go into a different structure. And I think this has been very difficult answer to get until very recently. But uh, I think the consensus now is that uh, at low temperature, and, and this is important because all the important interesting magnetism happens at low temperature, and that's the this is a structure for the low temperature. Uh, it is a, a, a so-called R three bar or R minus three structure, and the way actually sort of you can think of this is instead of a, a, a stacking or the shifting along the A direction, if you shift to this uh, uh, honeycomb plane along the B direction, you will get uh, this R minus three bar, uh, R three bar actually crystal structure, and you can immediately tell that there's difference between this and this structure because the C two M structure is has a twofold symmetry, right? So it's uh, it breaks actually the uh, uh, the overall crystal symmetry. Uh, it has a basically uh, is is has is twofold symmetry. But in the R minus three structure, you actually preserve this hex the 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 rhombohedral uh, symmetry. Uh, so that actually it turns out to be important. Uh, but going from the C two M room temperature structure to low temperature structure, there is a, a, a sort of you can have a twinning, so you can actually stack along this direction or sort of positive B direction or stack along the negative B direction, like shown here. Um, I, I I sort of said that this is the what's a sort of kind of structure the answer uh, 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 to the question about what the, what is the structure. But it turns out, and, and it took a really long time to get to this this point. And because the, there is a, a lot of actually confusing uh, data. So or older data, old sort of like older generation of crystals uh, shows that the C2M structure is, is found at low temperature. So if you look at the data, it's just very clearly C2M structure. So that's kind of a kind of puzzling thing. And then that's probably is due to the sample quality. And uh, there was actually another work done by uh, a post-tech group, uh, Park et al. Uh, so they reported actually this structure in, the, in their archive paper, but uh, for whatever reason, they uh, didn't publish this for a long time. So I think this was kind of buried somewhat. Uh, only recently with better crystals, uh, I think consensus emerged. And uh, and, and the, here's actually illustration. Uh, so this is a take, data taken from the, the neutron diffraction uh, work uh, done by uh, people at Oak Ridge. Um, and uh, here actually sort of it illustrates the why there's difficult, uh, why it is difficult to actually uh, understand the crystal structure. So this is a room temperature structure. And then you can uh, see that this, and then this is a, a BC plane. And you can sort of look at this uh, sort of a, a schematic illustration of BC plane here. And because uh, the room temperature, it is a, a sort of a shifting along the A direction. So B direction, there is actually no shifting. So you actually have all the integer peak positions in this sort of kind of notation. But if you go to low temperature, because of the shift along the B direction, then you will actually see these peaks kind of uh, uh, sort of having some angle to this. So you can sort of follow uh, here, there's a dashed line or like running this way. And that's basically what is observed. But also because of, of the twinning, you can also uh, have a different type of uh, crystals 
structure that's sort of running in this way. So there are two types of twins and they will actually show both peaks and these points. So you can sort of see that this integer peak is gone here, but uh, there are two this, uh, uh, the peaks that's uh, uh, sort of uh, happening in one third and two third positions. And these are arising from the twinning. Also, these two peaks come from another crystal symmetry called P3112. So this actually makes it sort of unclear which of this crystal symmetry actually these two peaks suggest. Are they twinned R3 bar or are they uh, P3112 crystal structure? Um, right. So, so that actually breakthrough I think we made is that uh, uh, we found actually a crystal that is, uh, uh, turns out to be almost twin free. So here you can uh, sort of see that this is the uh, high temperature structure. Again, this is, uh, there's all the peaks at the integer positions. And here uh, there's a sort of a twi uh, uh, sort of a tilting because of the peak peak shift or, or uh, I think the, the shifting in the different directions. But you can see that there's only one type of actually uh, these peaks shown. And you can sort of see that uh, in the, the line scan here, the, the red is the high temperature and the low is actually a low temperature. You see that the peaks just shift to one, one step here. And then there's a, a sort of a basically nothing on the, the twin position. So this sort of really shows that this, it is R3 bar crystal structure uh, that actually is responsible for the low temperature crystal structure. Um, and, but uh, I, I sort of told you that uh, we were kind of lucky because uh, we found this uh, almost twin free crystal structure, but uh, there are other samples that we found which shows a very uh, clear uh, twinning. So this is an example of this uh, kind of maroon colored uh, behaviors are sort of two twin things. And then the red one actually shows only one peak. Uh, uh, and then there's a, sort of this twin position is almost gone. And you also see that uh, there's a, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, single uh, twin domain P sort of sample has higher transition temperature than this uh, twin samples at uh, 6.5 Kelvin. Um, so do, do you know what controls twin? Um, no. Okay. So uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, so this is, a, so, so we, we don't know. So we sort of uh, take sample and cool down. And so I, I guess we now know, I think that if we, the transition temperature is 6.5 Kelvin, we basically don't, um, don't worry about it. I think the even in the 7.2 Kelvin transition samples, some of them are twinned. So, so it, it, is, it is unclear what, what controls the twinning. Yeah, so there's probably some kind of uh, uh, the pinning centers or some, some kind of a defect that is uh, originally there that probably sort of nucleates the twinning. That that's sort of guess, but we don't really have a clear understanding of what, why, what's caused causing this twinning. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. So, um, but the, that's that's a lot about the the structure so far. I think the the, the nothing about the magnetism so far. So let's talk about magnetism. So, um, I and mean, one might ask: So, does it really matter? I mean, we are talking about honeycomb lattice, and then uh, why? Why do we care about the twinning of the stacking faults and all these things? And it turns out that this does matter because uh, uh, if you actually think about the single layer honeycomb layer, and then if you think about the magnetic order, or or so let's let's before going to magnetic order, um, so then then. You you would think that the the say a Bragg peaks along this and then then this direction they should be all equivalent, but we found was actually at uh, room temperature, which is again in the monoclinic structure, these are inequivalent. So this uh, the peak position this is basically the the along the red line here, and then these two ones, uh, these are there are two of these peaks. So they are actually occurring at the different uh, uh, the the Q, the two theta values or the. Or, or Q vectors. So that means that actually there is a slight difference in the lattice parameter along this direction and along this direction. And this goes away at low temperature when uh, the sample becomes a rhombohedron. So what that means is actually when you uh, go to, uh, uh, when you are in the monoclinic uh, structure, it it's not just a the, the, the sort of a stacking along, along the, the monoclinic direction. Actually, the, somehow these stacking causes the, the sample to, or the honeycomb layer to distort slightly, and therefore it loses its actually kind of isotropic honeycomb lattice uh, uh, condition. And 
we can actually see this actually clearly in the magnetic susceptibility data. So um, in this is the sort of typical magnetic susceptibility data we uh, can see in all our samples. And then you can see that there's a, some sort of a small uh, bump here. And uh, by the way, this is all obtained by applying magnetic field within the, 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 within the honeycomb layer. Uh, and then if you zoom into this, then you see something like this. And then uh, what's interesting here is that, by the way, this sort of shows that there's a, 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 a first order transition with the history, hysteresis behavior. Uh, and, and, and also I think the, what happens is that at high temperature, so above the transition temperature, you see these different uh, lines that corresponds to different uh, field directions within the honeycomb plane. But all these differences go away when you go to rhombohedral crystal structure. Again, this actually uh, sort of proves that the symmetry, the or uh, honeycomb, or sort of uh, I think uh, honeycomb symmetry is uh, or six-fold rotational symmetry is recovered at low temperature, while that doesn't exist at at high temperature. Why why does high temperature magnetism actually important? I think I'll come back to that uh, in a, a little bit while. And this actually is uh, very easily understood by just uh, uh, looking at the, uh, the uh, sort of calculating high temperature series expansion. This was done by uh, Lampen Kelly et al. in, in Steve's group. And uh, they actually sort of looked at this and then do the, uh, 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 the high temperature series expansion of the magnetic susceptibility will be uh, some, uh, this uh, oscillatory behavior in the, in the two-fold monoclinic uh, uh, phase. And, these are angles, so A, B, A, A prime are there. So field directions that we use to obtain these things. And then you can very uh, sort of uh, easily see the, the, the sort of the, the or, or the explain the, the change in this uh, uh, value uh, as you change the uh, magnetic field directions uh, sort of very clearly. There is actually a very recent work uh, done by uh, Steve Julian's group and in our department. Uh, uh, shows uh, again very very clearly that at low temperature there is a six-fold symmetry is being is is recovered. So uh, using torque magnetometry, so they actually did a lot of uh, very careful study of different types of samples, and then in a good so-called good sample that that uh, we we found uh, a very clear uh, sort of uh, so uh, magnetic transition uh, struct uh, uh, signatures, they can see that this uh, sawtooth behavior. And then this sawtooth behavior sort of turn is uh, every repeated every sixty degrees, right? So this uh, sort of clearly shows that there is a six-fold uh, symmetry as you rotate the sample uh, against the magnetic field directions, and that is a uh, very easily understood in the, in their model here, actually showing that there's a spin flop type of transition as you rotate the sample sixty degrees, uh, and and then so on. So I think that you can sort of use this uh, simple uh, modeling. Uh, uh, you can. Uh, figure out uh, how this uh, uh, sort of sawtooth behavior is obtained. Um, you can actually also see that although there is a sawtooth behavior, this behavior is different from actually the theoretical calculation. And then you can sort of squint your eyes and then see that actually there is a, a additional two-fold symmetry on top of this, right? So there's sawtooth behaviors, this is six-fold, but the, this is low and then this is high. And that is actually kind of like there's some kind of additional component that is uh, uh, sort of having a periodicity of uh, 180 degrees. And that is because of the present presence of the this C2M. So when I said this is phase transition, uh, we can see this uh, single uh, uh, sort of twin sample going from uh, monoclinic phase to uh, rhombohedral phase. Um, but if you really uh, look at this carefully, so it's not clear uh, at this point here, but uh, you can see that there is actually small peak at the integer uh, positions, even for the low temperature. And that's also uh, kind of clear in this data here, you can see that there's a faint peak at the integer positions over there. So, so that means that even though you go through this structural transition, there's a small, but non-zero fraction of high temperature structure remaining, which is high temperature structure with this anisotropy and, and also the, the, the two-fold symmetry remaining. And that's the con sort of contributing to this thing. And um, it's also unclear 
how we can get rid of this. So that is actually something that we are actively investigating. So uh, one we, way we actually kind of uh, uh, made progress is uh, let's do uh, some systematic, uh, I guess, uh, sort of way of uh, damaging your sample. So I think we decide to do uh, exfoliation. And uh, there are a lot of interest in exfoliation of this material. So this is a 2D material, and then people can actually uh, cleave it down to a monolayer and then the uh, uh, Wei Chen's group in Waterloo actually showed a really nice uh, result in, in their study. But uh, let's actually try to sort of uh, start with a, a sort of bulk crystal. So here is a bulk crystal. And then you can cleave it down. And then as you cleave, you get you sometimes get really beautiful surface. And then, uh, to, to, and then measure the uh, magnetic susceptibility. And now that we know magnetic susceptibility uh, is a good a way of telling us about the structural phase transition, let's see what happens. So here is the temperature versus the susceptibility curve. Uh, the black one is the original, uh, the uncleaved data. And then you see this uh, sort of clear sort of difference uh, transition uh, sort of uh, this uh, goes away around 120 Kelvin. As you go t thinner and then cleave more, these transitions seems to be uh, increasing. And then at the the five cleave, which is actually at the, I think this one here. So this, uh, the red, uh, not complete red, uh, so, I don't know, the, the, this, this, this thing here. Um, and you can see that the, the difference or anisotropy remains all the way down to 40 Kelvin. Actually, for that matter, it goes all the way down to here. So, and then you immediately see that there's this transition happening at around the 14 Kelvin, and you still see some uh, behavior uh, like at seven Kelvin, but this uh, 14 Kelvin transition is appearing when the, the transition, the structural transition is incomplete. So I think this kind of suggests that this, uh, this means that as you cool down C2M structure still remains. Maybe actually there's a some of the samples transitioning to the, the, the rhombohedral structure, but the monoclinic structure survives down to very low temperature here. And that is uh, what gives this uh, uh, sort of a 14 Kelvin transition. So in other words, when we actually talk about very thin samples with uh, uh, sort of a kind of a bad, uh, so-called bad quality crystal, and, and that is a usually signified by the, the, the phase transition at 12 or 14 Kelvin. And that actually is coming from the remnant of a C2M or high temperature structure. And if you sample transitions completely clearly into a rhombohedral structure, you will get a really good crystal. So, and, and that also is very clear from, uh, from just looking at the, the magnetic uh, structure because in the R3M, because you are, so, so by zigzag order looks like this. So what I'm plotting here is that zigzag order, so this is a, a, the AB plane, but if you look from this BC plane from the side, right? So then you will see these two uh, uh, spins. Uh, those are these two spins. And then these are, so red spins here are shown here. And then as you can see that because of the stacking uh, along the B direction in the R3 bar structure, then the, only way you can actually have uh, this kind of a, a, a sort of a structure when you assume that their interlayer coupling is antiferromagnetic is this type of three layer structure. And that actually works out perfectly for the observe, observe the uh, magnetic structure. But if you have a C2M, this is a monoclinic structure where the stacking doesn't occur along the B direction or the, uh, the stacking along uh, sort of a shifted along the A direction. So then I think you will basically see this thing sort of a, a all the way sort of kind of pushed it back. That means you can have this type of structure. Therefore, this will be uh, uh, the two layer uh, periodicity. And that is actually uh, sort of known for some time that uh, this, uh, the 14 Kelvin ha is associated with a two layer structure. And this one is a, a three layer structure. Okay, so um, so because so so speaking of magnetic structure, um, I want to sort of uh, go back to uh, sort of talk about magnetic structure uh, a little bit more about uh, more about the magnetic structure. Uh, 
in 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 this context. So here, I think that so I, I sort of uh, I sort of plotted already here that the, it turns out that the magnetic ordering, the spin moment, is not confined in in the in the AB plane. So they actually have sort of a, a component that's along the along the C direction. So that's why I think if you project along the BC plane, you can still see moment uh, sort of showing up here. Um, and 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 sort of uh, from the side AC, then you can sort of see that the the moments are pointing along this direction, and then that sort of shows another way of uh, sort of representing magnetic ordering. Um, it turns out that you can actually have so there's no a priori reason for moment to uh, point along this direction as opposed to pointing along this direction, like uh, here. So where the point the so moments are pointing towards actually the apical auction rather than actually uh, the equatorial uh, uh, sort of a plane of the of the this octahedra um and uh so uh, uh Saluka and Kalulin uh, sort of looked at this problem and they found that actually there is a it's it's actually a very important information which direction these uh, magnetic moments are pointing at because the reason why this magnetic moment is uh, uh, lifted away from the AB plane is this so-called gamma or uh, the uh, off-diagonal exchange interaction. I think the people these these days call just gamma interaction, and these gamma interactions basically is the reason why this uh, the 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 moments are lifted away from the AB plane. And depending on the sign of this, uh, uh, the interaction, I think they can uh, sort of point in this way or that way. And uh, depending on the whether or not type interaction is a ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic, you can also have a different result and so on. So these are sort of important, uh, uh, it sort of uh, has important information about the, the magnetic Hamiltonian. Um, so that's uh, what, uh, and then they actually did some calculation about the, what is the, the dependence of the, the angle. So that's the so angle uh, alpha, which is the angle that moment is making with respect to the AB plane uh, is, uh, is, uh, 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 is, is as a function of a gamma interaction. Um, and and it, so this actually was a, a great news because uh, uh, what we can do, I mean, uh, with using uh, resonant X-ray uh, scaring, resonant elastic X-ray scaring is that you, we can tell uh, the moment direction or order moment direction very uh, well uh, by doing a so-called azimuthal dependence. So the idea is that if you have a sample and then this uh, 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 purple arrow is the moment direction, and this, uh, and then this uh, uh, red uh, arrows show the photon, incoming photon, and outgoing photon. And the intensity of your magnetic peak as you rotate your sample uh, with the Q fixed or the magnetic peak fixed is that the how much overlap does the outgoing photon has with the, the moment direction? So by rotating this, you can see that when the this uh, purple arrow moves away from this plane, then it will drop. And, and, and then when it goes this way, then it will be uh, sort of almost uh, very zero, uh, almost zero and so on. So, so that's basically uh, what we can do. And that's exactly what we did uh, of, uh, several years ago. Um, and it was uh, uh, published uh, uh, sort of five years, uh, like four years ago. And so this is the result. So as you uh, rotate your sample, the azimuthal angle, then uh, you can uh, see that the intensity goes up at a certain angle and goes down, it becomes a zero and then goes up and small and so on. And then you can uh, easily uh, model this based on the, uh, the, 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 where the moment, how, how much the angle this moment is making with respect to the sample uh, or the AB plane. And it turns out that uh, there's a, a model with uh, about, uh, I think it's uh, 30, 32 degrees actually works out pretty well. And, and more importantly, I think the this angle of positive 32 degrees is uh, is uh, is what it means that it is uh, this type of uh, uh, the moment direction with respect to the octahedra, not this type of uh, moment direction. So that was a fairly clear result that, and then we found this uh, very uh, very satisfying. And on top of that, this actually means that you need actually reasonably large magnetic, uh, 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 large uh, interaction or so-called gamma interaction. Uh, and that means that uh, you need 
Uh, and then this large gamma interaction is is the reason why uh, the this alpha rutinium chloride has a large magnetic anisotropy, and you can explain your uh, uh, the field dependence or susceptibility using uh, these parameters that is uh, determined from the our resonant uh, uh, elastic X-ray scaring result. And large gamma is also compatible with some of the theoretical work where, where uh, they have actually shown that you can uh, explain the neutron result by assuming a large gamma. And that actually kind of works pretty well to explain this actual inelastic neutron scaring data from uh, uh, Steve uh, Nagler's group. Um, However, what we were actually somewhat unsure or the kind of I was uh, uh, worried about was the sample that we used to study this magnetic order moment was a so-called the C2M sample. So the, here's the, the order parameter measurement of that sample, meaning that the transition is around 12 Kelvin. So this is again the C2M crystal uh, the transition. And this has uh, uh, the two layer uh, uh, periodicity along the L direction, meaning that you will have a peak at 1.5 rather than 1.3 in this, uh, this notation. Okay, so that actually uh, is something that uh, was uh, sort of an open-ended question for, for us. So we decided to revisit this by studying new sample, now new, uh, the best sample that we can find with the R minus three crystal structure. And uh, this sample shows a clear phase transition around 7.3 uh, 7, 7 Kelvin. And here's the L scan, which shows really nice uh, peak. That is actually, uh, the L width is exactly the same as the Bragg peak width. So meaning that it is a long range order along the L direction as well. So let's see what happens to this sample if you do the same type of azimuthal dependence uh, studies. And, and, and we actually studied the other sample also. So this one has a 6.5 Kelvin transition temperature. And both cases, they show almost identical behavior. And if you actually sort of model this, uh, and then and then also uh, so another way of uh, uh, fitting this is actually finding where the, this, this uh, azimuthal uh, dependence goes to zero uh, and in this angle, azimuth which azimuthal angle does the intensity goes to zero? That it's another sort of a good test of uh, uh, whether or not the model works. So to make a long story short, the results from our new new study, new experiment. Um, by the way, this is not an easy experiment. It takes a long time, and then my students have spent the several uh, uh, beam times only to find the result is exactly the same as what we found uh, uh, five years ago, meaning that the angle alpha is uh, 31 degrees plus minus two, which is uh, pretty much the same as uh, uh, in this thing. So regardless, the, the bottom line is that the regardless of the transition temperature, or in other words, regardless of the, the quality of the sample, it seems like the, the, this uh, at least the magnetic moment direction is all, all consistent. And as I sort of alluded to you, the magnetic moment direction has, has magnetic Hamiltonian encoded in this. So meaning that I think the using the sort of so-called sort of in-plane Hamiltonian with all the uh, JK gamma model, I think justifies uh, the understanding or the tr at least trying to understand the magnetic uh, behavior of, of the system. Um, yeah, so this is a, one of those cases that we were looking for difference, but we didn't find difference. But I think all, all uh, regardless, I think this is an important result uh, to report. Um, so uh, let's see. I, briefly, I think I'm going to sort of give you a sort of a sort of punchline of the last part of this talk. So um, of the of this this uh, the third uh, experiment that I'm going to tell you about. So this is uh, sort of referred to the electronic Hamiltonian of Kitaev materials, and it's uh, more of a somewhat of an advertisement for resonant in last X-ray scaring, which is uh, the technique that uh, I've been deeply involved in. And I think the uh, uh, Mark Dean, uh, uh, Matthew Mitrano, and Steve Johnston. I think we wrote. Uh, 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 I think perspective or, or so-called a forward-looking perspective article for PRX uh, for resonant elastic X-ray scaring, which will uh, come out soon. Um, and uh, so the, the main sort of idea is that you can study a lot of different uh, excitations using RICs. And one of the well-known of this uh, example is uh, uh, the so-called orbital excitation uh, shown here. 
and sometimes called DD excitation or sometimes called the spin orbit excitation in the in the context of the uh, iridates and ruthenates where uh, so sort of what we are pre pre primarily observing is the transition between J effective three halves and J effective three uh, one half states here uh, using this uh, the Rick spectrum. And from this, you can see that there is uh, actually the, the main peak, main sort of uh, transition will be uh, given by three lambda over two where lambda is a spin orbit coupling, but also you might see some splitting uh, uh, due to a sort of trigonal distortion or something like that of the J effect of three halves levels. And we have uh, sort of observed this in many different iridates. And for, for ruthenium, uh, ruthenium trichloride, this turns out to be very difficult for, for uh, various reasons, and more, like uh, very, for basically technical reasons. But we actually did the experiment, uh, and then we were able to see that this uh, sort of main peak here is uh, sort of crest, uh, uh, consistent with uh, assuming that the lambda or the spin orbit coupling here is about, uh, I think, the sort of the 1.5 uh, or like 150 milli electron volts. So I'll skip this instrumentation. So, so this is what we saw uh, with the with the our first experiment, but you can always improve in your instrumentation, especially Rick's instrumentation has been improving quite a bit. So uh, recently, or not, actually not even recently. So I think in 2022, we did uh, uh, more uh, measurements using a better resolution. And this uh, sort of thing here turns out to be much more uh, uh, sort of structured shown here. So this is, uh, there's a, this a small peak here, and then there are two peaks that's uh, occurring at, at higher higher energy. And when I saw this, when I first saw this, uh, the, the original data didn't really, uh, was surprising, but this was really surprising to me because this looks very much reminiscent of the observation we made for iridates. This is a sort of a, a, a honeycomb lattice iridates of a sodium iridium oxide, which is a red line. And then green line is uh, the alpha lithium iridium oxide, again, honeycomb lattice. And they show, show that there is a big peak feature here with a smaller feature at lower energy. And then this is a kind of similar here, big feature here and smaller energy. And if you don't believe this, you can actually uh, really uh, sort of uh, scale all the features uh, by spin orbit coupling. And this is a sort of E over lambda plotted uh, for lithium iridium oxide, sodium iridium oxide and alpha ruthenium uh, trichloride and you can see that the so energy scale in the spectral look, looks uh, quite uh, uh, striking, actually similar. And then, by the way, here the resolution is not good enough to resolve all these features, but overall features are, are, are sort of a kind of a spectral looks very similar. Um, why are they important? Because I think the this uh, the these two are similar, and then that's a sort of good reason why they are similar. But ruthenium chloride is nothing like. Uh, sodium iridium oxide from electronic point of view, right? So this is a, a very good insulator with the large insulating gap, and it is a ruthenium, there's a chlorine, and all these things, there's no reason for them to have actually similar uh, uh, sort of uh, spectral features as, as this. Um, and so we did some uh, cluster calculation with our collaborator, and, and so what you see is that if you actually have uh, just a local uh, excitations and with some uh, crystal field splitting, you will see something like this as, as you expect. But to explain these additional features, you actually go beyond single side calculation. And if you do a four side or six side calculation, you actually get reasonably close uh, uh, explanation of what's happening here. And this was actually kind of uh, sort of uh, originally reported by uh, Bum Hyun Kim and, 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 and so on uh, and co-workers saying that uh, so these features are all coming from actually this uh, inter-side excitation and they actually term this a whole on double and bound state. But even before going there, uh, sort of uh, I want to point out that that sort of suggests that the, this, the, the spectral feature means that uh, th there is a quite a bit of actually uh, itinerancy, right? So the non-local non physics that's uh, electrons uh, are not just happy to be localized and be uh, completely insulating behavior. So it seems like there is a itinerancy that's uh, baked into electronic structure of this material, which actually is 
kind of what uh, was originally suggested in, in all the years. But we sort of kind of uh, found this uh, uh, striking similarity between three different types of uh, archetype materials. And then uh, that, that was actually an uh, interesting observation that we made. Um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll stop here. So I think I'm kind of, uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, so the time... It's uh, 55 minutes, I think. I, so, so, so let me let me just uh, summarize what we I have been discussing. So, the conclusion is that there are three sort of uh, stories that I told you. So, one is the crystal structure of our alpha ruthenium chloride. Uh, uh, I think is uh, now solved. I think the room temperature is monoclinic, low temperature is rhombohedral, and uh, there is a first order structural transition occurring around 150 Kelvin, but at least in all the samples that we studied, and at least the things that uh, we find in in the literature. There seems to be uh, the the it, this transition is not hundred percent all the time. I think the this transition sort of make, means that there is a, some remaining uh, uh, a high temperature structure that is kind of uh, seeped into the physics of the low temperature physics, uh, and then uh, and gives uh, rise to this twofold symmetry. Magnetic structure. I think the uh, the bottom line is that the 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 C two M structure is uh, is is it uh, is 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 found on the fourteen Kelvin for for I guess worse samples and better crystals order at uh, higher temperature around seven point five Kelvin uh, and moment direction is not dependent on T N or quality of the samples and then the lastly I sort of talked about our study of electronic Hamiltonian using RICS and uh, we found that all the Kitaev uh, sort of a uh, representative Kitai materials, it seems like a uh, fairly significant uh, um, itinerancy should be so considered. I don't know what that really means, but uh, it's, uh, that's, that's, that's basically what we found. All right, so uh, thank you. And uh, um, yeah, so I'll stop here. No, no, it's very, very nice. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, quite, I mean, okay, this is quite something new that I didn't, you know, quite completely learn. But first question I have is that, uh, how do you actually understand the system changes from monoclinic to rhombohedral? So typically, in most materials, when you cool down, you, you typically lower symmetry, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, how how do you understand that from from you know a, 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 you know energy perspective? So I think the um, that's an excellent point because that's uh, the original the I I I so yeah so I I I also thought that this is impossible uh, originally when sort of uh, I think the this uh, let's go back to this one yeah. Yeah, it was suggested originally that uh, this this is what's happening, but if you actually, so, so the if if you think that the, it's it's all I mean it's, I think there is actually DFT calculation uh, 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 showing that all different types of actually stacking, mm -hmm. it, it, the energy difference is very 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 small, and then and that's the reason why there are a lot of stacking faults and there's a lot of I mean that's why I think that it's a it's a the, Essentially, there's no bonding, right? So because the the of so it's a it's a really small energy scale difference between these two things, and if you actually go from here to there, I think you actually if you push it not this way, but you can just push it that way, and so this is a like how I don't know half a, a octahedra push here, but if you push this half octahedra along this direction, then you get something like this. And then half octahedra this way. But naively, you well, would have thought that that's against the entropy argument, right? Um, I mean, why? you know, more ordered, you know, has you know lower entropy, right? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the the idea is that there, the, the I mean, there's a really. Yeah, I I don't think this is more ordered. This is more. This is more ordered than that. I see. So, so you I don't think, think, that, you don't, you don't think so it's it's just a matter of how you stack two things, right? Okay. Okay. And and I think that's that's my understanding. And so so yeah. So I think the energy difference is maybe it's meta stable, right? So maybe they maybe that's why it doesn't want to sort of transition all the way. I see. Right. So, so I think that is. yeah. So that that could be. I, I so I I do not have a clear answer to your question. Yeah. So the other question I have is, I mean, you, the, the, the a low temperature, the magnetic structure seems to be, you have three twinning, right? Do you know at what the magnetic field, implant magnetic field, these three twinning will be rotating in a direction perpendicular to the field? I mean, sort of spin flop transition? You mean the torque? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so talk, talk, talk about measurement. So this right? is this is a four Tesla, yeah. I see. So, so, so. I mean, I guess a certain amount of fuel you suppress magnetic order, right? The question is, uh, you know, in, in all anti ferro magnet, when you turn on a magnetic field, you know, the the, the anti ferro magnet tend to be aligned perpendicular to the field. Right, direction. right, yeah. So, yeah, you, so, you, so, I mean, we 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 have done this actually. So, uh, using neutron scale, you can actually, if you just apply field, I think a spin mm -hmm. flop transition happens around one or two Tesla. Oh, so after one or two Tesla, it becomes a single domain magnetically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. I see, I see. That's actually kind of interesting, right? I mean, do, do, do Steve I mean, or any other people see... Wait, wait, wait. What do you mean the magnetically single domain? Um, yeah, because you... I mean, because you, you right, it, it's, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be single domain, right? Well, I mean, because magnetically, it's basically like either A... I mean, it basically looks like a B, right? Oh, no, not like B. Like, you know, B, you know, A panel, right? Right, panel. right, right. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so, yeah, okay. It's a magnetic single domain, right? So that, yeah, that yeah, means... Yeah. Yeah, so that means basically means that you know, have people look at the spin excitation in that situation to see whether you know it's really sort of a spin waves. Yeah, yeah. To, to determine the fundamental, you know, exchange coupling constant, that's quite hard, I, right? I, 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 Steve has a data of uh, in the magnetic field under magnetic field, right? So they measured every, every, mm -hmm. so all, 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 pretty much everywhere. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. That's actually interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, but for, for your last type of so for your last measurement where you look at the you know the the, the Rick's measurement. So, so you're basically looking at the electronic excitation. Those are not, you know, sort of a spin waves, right? The energy too oh, large. Those, the, those are high energy excitation. This is a we are talking about band structure, basically. Yeah. I see. I see. So, so basically, but, but you're saying that they still have some dispersion, or the dispersionless. They have a dispersion, but very very small dispersion. Yeah, I guess depending on what you how you call it. I mean, they, they, it's a it's a like so actually. If you go to, so I guess I don't have the dispersion data here, but uh, so, right. So the, these peaks here, so if you actually follow this as a function of uh, uh, momentum, they they show um, like really, really small amount of dispersion in this energy scale, but that, that could be like 10 millivolts, right? <laughs> so so, so where's, where's a spin wave stops? You know, for for after the trichloride, spin wave is uh, uh below ten milli milli electron. Oh, that's all. So below ten yeah. MeV. Yeah. Oh, Actually, that's quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, this material is fascinating. I mean, so so basically, you, the, the, it it doesn't matter. You know, whether it's a two fold or or three fold, your canting angle is the same, and your right. magnetic structure doesn't you know more or less the same. But the, do do people know the correlation between the the crystal structure? And, and you know your introduction uh, thermal hall you know anomaly there's uh, there's uh, there's uh, whether there's any correlation between the two um the, the Yuji Matsuda experiment i guess uh, you know yeah so i think the the idea is that the all all the so the magnetic structure of pretty much the anything matters is this 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 type of ma so this is sort of a i think people call this bad uh, uh crystal so i think the this is the crystal structure, I think, the or the magnetic structure that people uh, are are associating with everything that we think of it as a as a good crystal. So it's a seven, mm -hmm. it's a seven point five Kelvin transition, three layer periodicity along the C direction. So that's sort of the the sort of, I guess, uh, a common way of describing high quality crystals. And that's happening. All the samples that I sort of talked about in in different groups. They're all basically show the same behavior, except for thermal transport. I see. So, so your your bottom line is it's not it's still yet unclear. You know what is really right. the. So I think that as far as uh, the crystal quality or the this uh, in the sort of more typical measure, it's uh, based on the TN or crystal uh, mosaicity and things like that. They they all all pretty equivalent, uh, um, but uh, they their thermal conductivity and thermal hold effect shows a fairly different behavior. Uh, would you expect thermal Hall effect measurement, you know, be able to also affect the magnets in the system? Because I mean, this sound, you know, after all, you know, on I mean, the magnets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. So um, I mean, that's a Young Beck's big theory. <laughs> it's a, it's a, <laughs> uh, um, yeah. So it's a, so I think the thermal Hall effect uh, is described by many different groups. I think the um, um the our Toronto group uh, led by Young Beck Kim actually has uh, this. 
uh, idea that topological magnon is responsible for this thermal fall effect. Yeah. I see, I see, I see. Yeah, very yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's a very, very fascinating material. So, so let me let me see whether uh, are there any other questions for for Young Young Jun? I have I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, this is in relation to oh talk. Chandra Chandra, can you turn on your video? Hi. Uh, uh, sorry. This is Chandra while... Chandra Verma. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a, a few years ago, uh, there were measurements of torque by uh, Ramshaw and collaborators in ruthenium chloride and also in one of the iridates. Yeah. And, and they showed that uh, if you measure the torque and you change the angle of the magnetic field across 90 degrees from the basal plane, there is a uh, huge uh, anomaly, almost like a first order transition. Uh, and this happens uh, when you are well out, even when you are well outside the antiferromagnetic region. Has anybody repeated those measurements? Are those, do, do, does your group? Uh, I, well, I clearly, I, I don't. So I think that's actually, this is a good question for. Uh, our collaborators. So I think this is actually work done by. Um, so this this is this paper actually uh, it's uh, uh, by Stephen Julian uh, has information about that one. So I think the I I think that so the what we found was a lot of those small samples that uh, people do use for torque measurements. They are all tend to be. Uh, C2M crystal structure, which, which means that they are very strongly uh, two-fold symmetric crystal structure. And so I wouldn't be surprised. I actually, I know what you mean, but I forgot actually the details about this, but the, I think the, um, so yeah, so we we actually, uh, so Stephen's group actually worked very hard to find uh, anything that shows this uh, six-fold symmetry, but the, uh, it's a, uh, and then you, when you actually have a two-fold symmetry, you're, you're looking, that, that signal dominates. Sorry, you are looking, you are varying the magnetic field in the basal plane in this yeah. measurement. Yeah, so uh, this is basically the yeah, angle. I was, talking angle. About, I was talking about the very anomalous behavior as you rotate the magnetic field out of the plane. Oh, okay. Just, just as it crosses 90 degrees, there is a singular change which has a periodicity of uh, high. Uh, the, do, do you remember those measurements of Ramshaw? But, but I mean, if it's a periodicity of high, I, I, I guess it, I, I don't would remember. I find, would I find those torque measurements in this paper by Julian? No, this is all the basal plane uh, measurements. Okay, so nobody has repeated these. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I, I'm working with actually Brad uh, Ramshaw and then also Kimberly Modich, uh, on, on the torque measurements. Uh, um, so I I'm I, I I don't know the details, but they are trying to probably reproduce that. Okay. Um, Thank you very yeah. much. So, so that work is going on. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other question for, for Young Jun? Yeah, but very, very fascinating material. I mean, Young Jun, this is really a lot of progress, right? Has been made over the years. Still, I mean, it's the, the, the many questions remain, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I think that at this stage it becomes very, very slow, right? So um, the <laughs> in, in, initial flurry of uh, uh, excitement to draw it's drive gone, it's gone, right? a lot yeah. of uh, uh, people to uh, get to this thing. I mean, I I kind of joke that we are we reach the like high TC moment in in the sense that uh, <laughs> now the it's it's a uh, very difficult to publish anything. So um, oh, it's only ten years, right? <laughs> right. So I mean, that that was the case when I when I was a grad student, and they they, they, they were joked that the, unless you solve the high TC problem, you cannot publish it. <laughs> and, and then I think it took a while to actually uh, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, to sort of get to a sort of more steady state. I think that we are kind of in a trough there where um, everything is done, so nothing new can be done. Kind of uh, stage. So um, yeah, there's a question from uh, Robin. Uh... Glecker to everyone, where, where did the perform uh, Rix? I guess he wants to know where the Rix experiment are done. I guess at Brookhaven, right? Uh, we did they, uh, Rix, Rix experiments and did they use exposure of bulk crystal? So this is a bulk crystal uh, done at various places. So the Rex experiments done at uh, DAISY, the 
uh, Petra 3 and also Brookhaven and the RIX experiments done at Brookhaven and the Diamond Lysors, all using bulk crystals. Oh, that you did it on six, the, the latest measurement? Yeah. Um, actually, this six measurement actually, we, no, I think our first measurement was done at six, yeah. Okay, very nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you so much, Young Jim. Yeah, it's a fantastic talk. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. Right. Thank you.